Okay. Janine, you're up. Okay, let me just fix my screen here. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are so lucky to have Dr. Mary Murphy back with us again. Um, this time to talk about how to help your middle school and high school children develop organizational skills for distance learning and for life. Um, we wanted to take a little survey first off to see if, um, if anyone was here for last week's presentation for the little ones. Look down at your screen, everyone who's participating, and raise, click the raise hand button if you were here last week. We're just trying to get a sense. I'll give you a second to do that. Right now we only have one. Only one? Yeah. Okay. Right now. So, um, so this week, uh, Dr. Murphy is going to focus on our older kids and how we can help them develop organizational skills that they can begin to use independently during distance learning and really throughout life. Uh, Dr. Murphy continues to work with students of all ages through COVID school closure via teletherapy, and she'll be able to help provide organizational tips and strategies for parents and especially for our older students to be able to implement at home on their own. And then also to be able to take with them throughout their post high school transition process and throughout life. Dr. Murphy is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in counseling, executive functioning, academic coaching, psychological testing, psychotherapy, and biofeedback. She has completed her advanced fellowship training at Yale School of Medicine and currently maintains a private practice as a professor at WestCon. Your moderators are Eve Kessler, founder of SpedNet Wilton, Carolina Corrigan, and myself, Janine Kelly. Just a few ground rules. Uh, please feel free to ask questions at the end of Dr. Murphy's presentation through the Q&A button. Um, use the Q&A button as opposed to the chat because the chat tends to disappear after a certain amount of time. And with the Q&A, we can keep track of what questions were answered. Also be mindful that this is an open forum and it's being recorded and it will be, it will be posted later on Facebook and on our website. So be mindful with your questions not to reveal any private information that you don't want out there. Also, any information provided in this webinar by Dr. Murphy or the moderators is not intended to be legal or therapeutic advice. The information, materials, and content is meant for your general purposes only. So with that being said, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Mary Murphy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me again. Um, I feel like I'm part of the Spidnet family now. It's like uh, nice to do things back to back too. Um, so I wanted to start by saying that um, I was just looking at the participant list. I do actually see a couple of repeat people from last um, week. And so just wanted to highlight that we're going to take a deeper dive into the sections where we can highlight what the older kids, our teens mainly, middle and high school kids um, would need in terms of organizational supports before. Um, so I'll kind of go lightly into some areas that we started with last week, but I will take a deeper dive into um, how to address and kind of modify this for older kids. Um, and then we'll have Q&A at the end, so you can feel free to ask questions um, about the specific um, recommendations, uh, apps, and different resources that I have uh, listed throughout as well. So as um, Janine was just explaining, I'm spending a lot of time with my private practice, all with teletherapy, and my, my primary focus is executive functioning. So I always work with clients uh, very uh, closely on what their schoolwork is, but now that everybody is home, I am you know, taking a, a, a joint uh, attack method with them where we are looking jointly at their Google Classroom together. We're taking a deep dive into how they're organizing themselves. And I wanted to just pass along some of the best tips and strategies, best practices that we've um, been coming across that's helping the older kids right now. So as we get started, and I click the next screen, uh, what we'll cover today are what are the kind of organizational challenges that we're seeing with our kids? And, and we're in the broader umbrella of executive functioning. Um, I'll explain what that is in a second. And then how distance learning has been posing very specific, um, unique challenges to executive functioning. The first thing that we're going to do 
is talk about how parents can help in different areas. One is how can we adjust our view of what's happening um, and really take a developmental lens and look at, for example, adolescent development and how it impacts their organizational challenges and executive functioning in general, and how we can use tools to enhance the learning environment that's age appropriate for this um, age group. And then what, what does science tell us about how students learn best and how we can help kind of impart the uh, learning tools that they can use as strategies for you know, moving on beyond in high school and college and life. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick background, which is just that when I keep saying executive functioning, this is what I'll be referring to. You know, it's a long term, so I say EF. So EF is um, really just what I affectionately I call it adulting. So these are our skills that we all manage to put ourselves together every day and achieve our goals. Um, but they're neurologically based skills, so they are brain based, and so they are um, under construction, and that's what that uh, brain with the scaffolding is to represent. I want you to always keep that visual in mind. So our kids, um, just kids by definition, as a child or an adolescent in general, they should have executive functioning uh, uh, challenges. They are weaknesses in areas where they end up having trouble with memory, with being able to think flexibly and control themselves. So these are really just what we call life skills. They are under development right now and they absolutely should be because executive functioning is not solidly in place until around age 25. So what we are seeing is absolutely normal. It is expected. This is what we should be seeing our kids struggle with. But what can we do to be alongside them and kind of help put the guardrails up and give them a path and help them get to the next step using skills that we've always um, developed over time as well. <clears throat> so I just want to tell you, these are the seven areas of executive functioning. The second one is organization. We chose to, to focus on that one because really if you can pull together the skills around organization, it helps support all areas of executive functioning. You really can't do any of the others without being organized. So how to organize and keep yourself on track is one of the major primary skills that um, adolescents and uh, children need to develop. And it encompasses all of these other areas. So the main point I want you to know is that, you know, we are working with um, uh, our framework is FedNet, right? So we are a network of parents who have children that have special needs of some kind. We have stumbled upon FedNet for a reason, right? We have kids that have special challenges. <clears throat> so they may have anxiety, they may have um, ADHD, they might have autism, they might have some um, conditions that makes their executive functioning a little bit weaker and a little bit more delayed in their development. It's widely known, and that's why I wanted to give you this reminder, that executive functioning age does not match a child's chronological age in any way. So when we have children that are having these challenges, um, it's expected that these executive functioning areas, so for example, someone who has ADHD, their executive functioning age might be as young as three years younger than the person next to them without ADHD. And so you might see very age you know, disparities between you know, uh, on a play date, you know, <laughs> you have like, uh, or your child's best friend, you see them come to the house a lot and they seem to like, you know, they seem to you know, get down to task and they can sit down and do homework with your kid and they seem to be the one helping to kind of bring your kid on track. So you know, the age doesn't always match. That's why we will see some, some lag and these are lagging skills for our kids. All right, so that's why we have this. Now add to the picture, you know, this was my little coronavirus slide that I found. It adds to this picture that we have now an incredibly odd, surreal experience happening in our life. So why are kids struggling even more now? It's because they have this new reality and the challenges come with that. So as we mentioned last week, just the framework is that we now have this unprecedented long time at home with kids that now have to exclusively learn on our own and with us side by side. We are now the source of their organizational support. We are the ones primarily providing executive functioning support. We might have been part of a much larger team 
that I know has not disappeared, and I should never you know, insinuate that our IEP uh, or our PBT team is gone, but we are it one-stop shopping for our kids right now. So we very much do not have a teacher alongside them. We don't have the social the psychologist. We don't have the OT and the speech therapist right side by side with us. We are finding ways to connect to them, but it is much more uh, in silos and separate than the way we had a team before. We are now having to do this. <clears throat> and we wanted to point out that anxiety under these circumstances of everything being so different, anxiety is produced by this new situation and it's hijacking our children's learning brain. So we're gonna talk about how we can adjust for that. And I just mentioned that um, we don't have our special services. The rules for screen is uh, completely different. I was joking that like, we used to have this mantra, like stay off the screen, no, no screens. And now it's get on the screen. You gotta get on the Zoom call, get in front of the computer by nine o'clock. You gotta do this, you gotta do all on screens now. Everything's so different. And we just have a very different set of organizational challenges than we had before. We might have seen that our kids could hold it together and they could get to school, write down their homework, organize their book bag. We finally got them to a point where they were kind of doing okay. And now they have completely different things that they're expected to do. They have signed into multiple platforms all day long. They have to you know, navigate, remember passwords, remember sites, go in and out deal with the technology failing, deal with even a teacher on the other side who can't keep up with them <laughs> because their technology skills are clearly not as good as uh, the kids. Um, so it's completely different uh, reining in and organizational challenges. And then just to point out, a lot of these strategies that I'm going to talk about are all really based on the challenges that parents have and how they can actually be helpful um, to their kids because we, re we recognize that parents are the ones who need the support because they're under stress like never before. So what can the parents do? We're going to focus on how to provide structure, predictability, and routine. Um, and we're going to adjust our expectations, thinking about school as uh, the school day, uh, not the school building anymore. We're thinking about structuring our day and keeping it just as routine as, as if they were going from class to class when the bell rings and they know to get up and go. That is something that we have new expectations for. We have to set up our own family structure where we have a routine, where we say that every morning we're going to do the same thing. We're going to always get up and brush our teeth, dress for the day before doing any work. We don't want to have kids feeling like they're in their pajamas all day, it denotes a less seriousness um, and, and also, you know, being in bed, doing your um, schoolwork from your bed. It's really, those are challenges that we want to help them set up, you know, a good habit, a good routine right up front because it's easy to slip into this. If they keep the same schedule all day, especially sleeping and waking, it can provide a lot of structure. One of my teens said to me um, that they called this a coronacation because they feel like they're on vacation, right? Oh, and it, it, <laughs> you're funny. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's not a vacation, but it's so hard to not associate it with that when you, you have like a snow day and, it, and you get to stay home, right? It, it denotes that feeling for kids. And so they have to really like start to understand the seriousness of this. For even our older kids, we really want to make sure that they're moving, that they're not just in lockdown, because they feel like they're in lockdown for everything. They need to know that they can get up and break out of this, the studiousness of being at a desk and break away to go take a walk, get out of that house for a little while. It's, it's um, to help restore sanity, definitely. And most teens are telling me that I'm working with that they just are faltering when it gets later in the day. And so starting the day a little early and having less to do, like less heavy um, academic work left in the afternoon, like maybe leaving specials, um, uh, not necessarily specials, but um, you know, non-core subjects for the afternoon. So that um, the thing that's kind of like the hardest to tackle, they're more alert and um, they haven't kind of burnt out their energy by then. So starting a bit early. And then um, we talked about making sure that they have fuel, you know, keep them fueled up, 
Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I keep hearing constantly that all kids are doing is eating at home. Uh, it's like the kitchen's there, never closed, and they're all like, it's time for a snack again. It's been five minutes. And, and it's, it's true. I mean, it's, it's just a new reality. And so they're adjusting, and I'm sure it's not going to you know, become a huge problem. I think during this adjustment period, just making sure that they've got their source of energy going, remembering to bring that to them. Um, especially with um, older kids, we want to think about the environment. So this might be a controversial topic. I'm going to say location of where you do your work. We have kids that we really do need to listen to. We can let them test things out because they may or may not be right, but there are some kids that really do want to be not in the center of the house. Do they have to necessarily be behind the door in their bedroom? No, that's more of an extreme too, but there really are some kids that are doing much better work when they have the locked in more focus when they're in their own space and their space has traditionally been the only space that belongs to them in the house technically is their bedroom. So there are some kids that are doing better. I wouldn't kind of get upset if there are parents out there that are hearing from their kids like um, that they want to do it there. The proof is going to be in the pudding, right? If they get the work done or they don't. You see on power school a bunch of stuff pop up that nothing is getting done. You take them out of the bedroom. You know, but there are some like ways that we can adjust our expectations and be a little bit more flexible. We hate having our kids behind, you know, their, in their bedroom doors, right? We don't want that, but it might actually be helpful for them. And I would let them try it. Thinking flexibly on our part might actually help with them. And moving around the house is, um, this is actually from uh, younger kids, but um, when you're doing other subjects, you might want to move around the house to not be just in one central location absolutely all the time. Um, <clears throat> and then we really want to think about what is their internal environment. So at any given moment, they actually may be um, feeling anxious. They might be feeling tired. I'm speaking with a lot of kids that are saying things like um, they're getting uh, lower grades than they used to. And I'm like, okay, well, let's look at it. Like, what could it be? I have one kid who discovered um, that, you know, as we look through when he was submitting the assignments, it used to be his favorite subject. And now all of a sudden it was the lowest grade and it was because he kept submitting it so late at night. And kids think they're invincible and they don't need sleep and that they don't get tired when they're really so tired and you, you see it on their face, but they don't recognize states of, you know, internal states sometimes, like hunger and being tired. So they have to be brought the snacks and they have to be brought a uh, clock and say, hey, it's time to shut this down and it's, it's too late to be submitting work. So you always want to be aware of whether they are um, showing signs of fatigue, um, hunger, um, or anxiety, um, emotions that are getting in the way of them properly learning and being able to organize and get their work done. And then I mentioned this before, that really screens are just not the enemy anymore. And so we want to have a different expectation of what um, we expect them to be doing right now. And then always make sure that um, we're encouraging them. I'm, I'm going to show you some um, apps and websites that can be used. But um, kids are pretty good about knowing to use Khan Academy, but they also might not know about some more fun apps um, like photo math, which is just fascinating and fun where you take a picture of an equation and it shows you a video tutorial of how to do the whole thing. Um, them get, encouraging them to check out the app store. So as soon as a kid says that they're having trouble with something, I am not homework support. <laughs> I can't even do second grade math. Like <laughs> my daughter's just off on her own. Like I really cannot figure that out, but I can figure out, okay, let's find somebody else to give the lecture because I didn't understand the way the teacher sent the video. So I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to see some really, you know, dynamic, really interesting, um, really good speaker talk about the same math concept and let it be heard again in a different way presented differently. Kids will then maybe get it. So using other alternative materials that are on the internet, um, through Khan Academy or um, even YouTube, um, those lectures have been great to get concepts that we don't get the first time. 
from our teachers. And then always, you know, encourage them um, to be using some socialization every day where they have um, Google Meets or Zoom sessions with friends um, or family. We want to encourage that. Always try to give them rewards. Um, we forget when kids are older that they could still respond to something like this. But, you know, we go to work for a paycheck, right? Like we all go and do things for rewards every day. And adolescents especially are completely hardwired for reward. So their brain is geared up. That's why they're video game um, focused, right? Because they get like rewards and constant uh, reinforcement. We need to think about how can they use rewards. Um, one reward that I use in adolescents is their phone. I say that they shouldn't have it in their room side by side or at their desk when they're doing their schoolwork, but they get it in a central location, like left in the kitchen where like parents are. And during breaks, they earn the, the time to go over there and they play with their phone. They can watch a YouTube video or something. Um, using a reward that they are keyed into, like phone, is, is usually you know, a, a really salient reward for them. And this is just a joke and it's left over from uh, the younger kids. But this is a placeholder to remind you that, you know, distance learners sometimes wear capes. Like they just, this is a placeholder to remember we should just do anything that works. <laughs> you know, like, so this is my daughter. She was sitting there. She could not get her work done. And she was just like, I want to, I, she wanted to wear a costume. And I was like, okay, I don't care. It's the middle of the school day. Go put a costume on. And, and now she walks around when she was doing a writing prompt that she couldn't figure out what to do. And she's like, Supergirl will know the answer. And she walks around and she's like, yay. She's like reinvigorated by doing something different. And, you know, kids can do, teenagers, any kid can really find something that changes up the day for them in some way. And so this is just a reminder that we have to find what those things are and let them do it. It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever works is going to be fine. So something that gives them just a mental break is also fine enough, all right? The biggest thing I want us to keep in mind about adolescents is the type of tools that work for them is something that's a good match for where they're at developmentally. So this is an incredibly difficult part of life. Adolescents are going through all changes head to toe in from physical, emotional, cognitive, brain, moral development, everything's in flux all at once. So they need tools that actually help bring the rails in and help them rein in their attention and their focus and their energy. What they're trying to figure out is their, their self-concept. They are right now, like just because we're doing, just because not we're doing COVID, but because COVID is happening, it doesn't mean that life has stopped and their development hasn't been continuing to go. They are in their formative stage of developing who they are and understanding their identity, their, their self-concept, their, the basis of their whole self-esteem is developing in this moment as we have them at home, and we can't forget that. So they are actually, you know, still trying to figure out who they are, still needing social connections so that they can figure that out even more, and they still need exposure to things that are enriching so that they can further develop interests that they might already have, um, but, you know, the traditional school day has taken some of that stuff uh, and exposure to that away from them. So there's some creative ways to do that. And this is just to remind you that the reason the brain is under construction is because we have this, um, we have to keep in mind that everything that's changing in their body, their brain is primarily what's changing. They're reorganizing and it's during this intensive remodeling that's happening with the, the neurons in their brain. It is happening right now at its most intense period, and that means that they don't have their executive functioning, which is the frontal lobes of the brain, fully online yet. And so we need to be kind of the, the guardrails for them. They are primarily running on the amygdala, which is the emotional seat of the brain, and that is why they are emotional. That's why they are responding to raw impulses and kind of instinctual behavior rather than well-reasoned and thought through problem-solving step-by-step uh, process that we do as adults. That's why we call executive functioning adulting because they are actually learning the skills to be adulting. 
eventually and by the time they're 25. So if your kid is 12 years old, do not expect at all that they are going to have these things fully in place yet. They just, they shouldn't. And what we need to do is understand that their brain in many ways can sometimes be conceptualized as having the gas, you know, the amygdala, um, fired up and looking for reward and uh, impulsive, but they don't have the brake system in place, the frontal lobes yet. So what can we do to kind of put that on um, those breaks in place for them? Schedule, 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 schedule. You know, like in re real estate, they say location, location, location. For us right now, we need schedules. We need to use organizational tools, um, put lots of schedules, like print out um, whatever can be um, like a timely schedule. This one is just from the internet, it does not have to be anything, except that it does point out um, that academic time is really only about three or four hours a day. It does not need to be spread out more than that. We need to let them explore, use visual tools, put clocks in places all right in their, like um, every child's desk should have a big clock prominently displayed so that they're getting on track and organizing their day and realizing, okay, the hour has passed. It is time now to go to the next task. We want to make sure that we're not forgetting to use things that they used at school, which is the printed schedules, right? Um, they used headphones to block out distractions. They very often need that even though they're home. So we don't want to forget that. They need a clean workstation. Even if they have, I've, I've had kids that have such a messy workstation that there's no way to even attack it. And so um, whether they have a clean or a messy workstation, I ask them to use these trifolds where they kind of are putting blinders on in their environment to be able to block out distractions visually around them. So we don't wanna forget that that's a basic that definitely helps um, when they're at school and they're taking benchmark assessments and SATs and even when you're older and you take GREs and such, they put you in corral desks that have these blinders on, on purpose because they work. What we wanna do with our um, teens, um, you know, they are young adults. So what we, knew we need to focus on is building the skills of executive functioning. So when they are trying to organize their day and you ask them what they need to do, they may say, well, I couldn't do something because this teacher didn't get back to me. Okay, there's, there's an opportunity for a micro skill right there. How do you structure an email to a teacher or somebody at the school that you have to talk to? Those are skills we cannot assume that they have and we have to do side by side with them until they can do it independently. We want to teach them about how to use assertive communication to respectfully request things from teachers and us. Uh, they, to organize their day and to get their work done, there's lots of opportunity where they have to advocate for themselves. They have to point out to parents who might not know the system. Um, power school is a huge struggle and people always say, okay, well, it looks like something's missing. Well, why do you have all these missing assignments? Well, Honestly, it, it might not be correct. The, a, a, a child who's advocating for themselves can say, well, honestly, there's this one teacher that only does it once a week. So it's always gonna look behind. But a child might not feel you know, assertive enough to be able to say that to the parent. And so then we have miscommunications. The thing we can always be helping them with is how are we organizing ourselves? Can we point out when we're using problem solving can we narrate as we go through our day more? I think that we forget when they're older, they look like little adults and we kind of like forget that they still could use these skills or that they might need to hear something. And so I think that you, we should be really saying a lot more about why we're doing what we're doing and not doing for them. And my mantra in therapy a lot with clients is that helping, when I talk to parents, I say helping is not always helpful. Because often helping from a parent's perspective is doing for them. And so it's not that type of help that they need. They actually need side-by-side -side standby support, not I'm jumping in to do for you support. So those are the skills that we need to help. Um, and how do we organize our day? Would we get anywhere if we didn't have our calendar and our phone beeping at us to tell us to go there? No. Not that we're leaving our houses right now, but still, we, we don't know when appointments are starting. We don't know when we're doing stuff unless we um, are keeping ourselves organized. So I would say point it out to them as we do it all throughout our day.
oh, my phone went off. You know, instead of just an, a, an alarm that says nothing to them, what if when you opened your phone, you said, oh, it's time for my meeting to start. There are subtleties in doing that that really can be picked up by the kids that we really could be taking advantage of. And then how do we track our activities? We use a calendar. We used to tell kids to use a planner, but honestly, this um, new online world system is something that could be really um, much more um, better organized by using something like a spreadsheet. So instead of trying my same old mantra that I used to give kids, which is use a planner, use a planner, I now say, you're on the computer all day, pull up a, a, a Google sheet and use a spreadsheet to organize each of your classes. Pop into Google Classrooms, write down each of your class names, and put what are the current assignments so that you have one thing at a glance all in one place. And this is an actual client that I'm working with who has done such an amazing job. I was so proud of her that I actually wanted hers as the example because it's been working really well and is, is such like a source of pride, I think, even because of the fact that she's using it successfully and parents are even seeing that she's using it. Like everybody has a chance to be proud about the development of these organizational skills. And they've all like responded to it so nicely. So I think that this is a, you know, a way to simulate what they need, which is what we all need, one place visually to be able to look at. We used to have a calendar in our kitchen growing up, right? And you know, a family calendar. That's how moms and dads will organize themselves. But kids who are in their computers all day need to keep up with the times. Kids who are in high school um, or even the middle schoolers are um, following letter days or number days in their school system. They have to remember, even when they're home, what day of the week it is. Is it a C day or a D day or whatever? I'm so glad we didn't have this when I was going to school. I never would have got through this. But they have to keep all that in mind. They have to know, like, okay, today was a flex day, so I can't contact my teachers. It's their day to uh, be quiet in the system, in the school system, and they, they're not taking questions today. You know, like, you have to remember all this stuff. But if you have in one place, okay, I have a master to-do list of things that are kind of on deck to do, and then I have current assignments for each class, and then I have this organization of, you know, what letter is today? And then power school. Power school is this huge thing, right? Um, and then I'm, I'm going to watch the moderator for a second. Um, do you use power school in Wilton? Okay, okay, good, because different school systems use different ones. Um, I'm in Newtown, so I'm just all about power school. So, so power school is always such a bone of contention, right? So um, one recommendation that I make right off the bat is that for parents and kids to be consistently on track together, they need to be using the same system. The kids often will just pop into the app and see minimal information and not the actual desktop where you can take the deep dive, see all the details, and then see that things might actually be missing that you didn't, the kid didn't know because they were checking their app. So listing, you know, setting a due date for yourself, putting everything that's considered missing, it highlights to the kids, okay, this is something that I have to email my, my teacher about. I have to tell the teacher that, you know, I emailed you this two weeks ago. Is it okay um, that I tell my parents that it's, the grade is being updated this week? You know, so it's micro skills of um, assertive communication, how to write an email to a teacher, how to keep yourself on track. When was it that I emailed that teacher? Should I be updating it again? You know, all visually in one uh, tracker. So the older kids are doing really well with using a system like this. The other thing I want to point out is that, you know, we are human. Our kids are human and they are prone to distraction and getting, you know, off track. And so we want to use distraction blockers. Um, these are apps and websites. Uh, the one that I like the best is... Um, uh, stay focused um, app, which goes across the desktops, laptops, and their um, uh, cell phones. And they can block specific uh, sites um, with specific apps. So TikTok and um, uh, YouTube and Netflix are the, the worst offenders. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we have um, uh, some blocking of the things that really are the most time suck. Um, when you look at screen time, I look at the um, I ask teenagers to look at it, their screen usage with me and it, it, each individual app that they're using the most. And that percentage is usually things like TikTok. 
and you say to them, okay, well, what would it be if you restricted just that one use of that app because it's really taking a lot of your day? So that's how you can help them see what problems might exist. And then to keep organized, you really have to think about their world is electronic. And so productivity apps, the ones that are the best well-vetted ones I gave you descriptions of so that you can use this as a resource in the future, I want you to think about um, encouraging them to check it out. Just say, here, these are some apps that came up in the presentation today. These are some things that you might be able to use to help keep yourself organized. Check these things out, see what you think. Um, so the most ringing endorsement that I've had is the Elise um, app, um, but also there's flashcards where they can help study and make little quizlets for themselves. The key was quizlet, I forgot to write that. Um, and then for these executive functioning skills, there may be skills that we did not touch on or mention, but they exist all in a very nice um, workbook format for teenagers. These are the um, well, the third one is understanding uh, your brain. That's for adults as well, but I use it all for teenagers because it's my favorite book. I use it for every single person. Um, <clears throat> that one by Ari Tucker is, um, it goes through what are the specific kinds of organizational tips that you could try and whether you know it works. And then if that doesn't work, you try the next one. And it's like a big Rolodex of options for them to keep trying. And for parents, I really want them to think about getting this book, either the audible version or um, the physical book. It helps really teach people, the parents, about why kids are having these kinds of struggles. And it gives very practical advice. And it also gives us a hard look personally at how we might be affecting, even with our expectations, um, about how kids are struggling with executive functioning. For kids individually to be able to um, focus on the um, a part of a, a part of this is you know trying to rein in your emotions, and so these are workbooks and books that teens can look at that are well vetted um, that I personally went through and made sure that they're good resources for kids. Um, adolescents don't like to be told, but they can be guided, and so I always think workbooks are wonderful because it's like here you go. Here's some information for you and you step away. <laughs> okay, you don't have to be the one to say, anxiety is really hard and I know there's a lot going on in your life. You can give them the information and they will more objectively read it and go through it on their own. I want you to think about what we know about our kids when we're trying to think of how we can recommend different strategies to them. So first is if you see that they're um, interacting by getting distracted by the computer, think about using those website blockers. Uh, think about putting their school station in the center of the house because maybe the bedroom or further away from you hasn't worked. Do they really need to be off the computer at times because it's too much or they're not getting a chance to work on their skills like handwriting? Um, and transcribing and are they not doing well when they study because they haven't written things down where that's how we encode things into our memory. Um, they may need to have a break from the computer at times. If we have uh, kids that are asking questions and kind of as seeking reassurance all day. This is a problem with uh, kids who are getting anxious while during COVID. They ask for reassurance a lot more. We want to um, consider using um, the strategy of saying, okay, at the end of the hour or at the end of each subject that you've done is your best with, you do as much as you can independently, and then I will help get you to the next level. I mentioned that before. I mentioned that before. Oh, the thing I wanted to mention about sometimes this eternal boredom that our teenagers are struggling with at home, and sometimes it's not even a matter of not being able to organize themselves but sometimes they're just in boredom mode and they just like are breaking down because of it. You want to also think about whether our kids need some enrichment. Do they need to do something that is separate and apart from school, but is school kind of related? So say your kid is really into engineering or like building things or something. Maybe they want to take an advanced class. Um, ClassCentral.com is a conglomerate, uh, a consortium of all of the Ivy League schools that have decided to put free college courses online. 
for like 450 classes right now, I think. And they can take a deep dive into this really amazing high level advanced subject that's just a specialty area that they're really interested in. You might have seniors right now that are scared to death about going off to college because they got abruptly cut off from their high school experience and they're wondering what it's like to take a college class. They are ideal for something like this. I think you only have to be 13 to sign a box and say you can get into Class Central. So even our young kids can be doing it or we can sign off on them that they can get into it. And so we want to really think about giving them an enrichment experience. It's something they have chosen when they go through that list. And this last part that I wanted to share is that we want to listen to science. We know how kids learn best. We know that they learn best in short blocks, like interval training, think about it at the gym. And so we want to use things like the Pomodoro technique. You can, I'll show you a website in a second. This is where we know that productivity is best in 25 minute blocks or bursts with a five minute break. We know that right now our goal is to help prevent regression, which happens every summer for all kids. Just the degree to which that happens is, you know, up for discussion. Um, now having an extra couple of months where they haven't had school, there is expected to be regression. And so we, we might not have to consider that we're looking for new learning right now, but maybe we're just trying to prevent regression. And then we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to scaffold everything that I mentioned about micro skills, putting apps in their, their path for them to consider using, giving them workbooks to work on different skills to organize themselves. If we can put that in place, we are scaffolding, like putting that up to shore up supports around them so that they can get more independent the next time they do that same type of activity. That's what scaffolding is, and science tells us that it works as parents and teachers. That's what we do for them. And then um, the last main point is that supporting mental health is the most significant thing that we can do. When we think about the organizational challenges and executive functioning challenges that kids have, we forget that it is actually emotions that throws everything off. And so if we can address learning by supporting mental health, they are much more available and able to attend to material. <clears throat> so I talked about how we can model our own executive functioning by showing and narrating what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we stay organized. And then I'm going to show you also what co-regulation means, which means sharing our emotions with them in a positive way, not when we're having a bad day. <laughs> but co-regulation is sitting side by side with them while they're having a hard time and sharing our sense of calm with them, doing breathing with them, sharing some of the apps that I'll show you in a second. Um, this is how to find the Pomodoro technique. Co-regulation is where you start first at the bottom with regulating their emotions, helping them regain a sense of composure and calm, relating to them, and then starting to talk to them about how they're feeling so they can connect what was just happening for them and learn from that experience for the future. I always forget to include this, so I'm very proud of myself for remembering that um, sleep makes everything worse. Mental health, executive functioning, everything. So the best brain science out there, cognitive science says that this um, type of sleep with the binaural beats is um, so incredibly helpful. I use this every night myself. Uh, my daughter uses it. It is just programmed in Alexa to know it. So this is on YouTube for free. It runs for 10 hours for free on a continuous loop so that you never um, have to buy it and you never have to um, turn it off because it runs all night. And then these last things are all apps for you to try. Um, kids are good. The younger kids are good with these stress management tips and uh, apps, I mean. And then when you get to older kids, you know, high school kids, you want to use apps like um, Stress Guide and Calm. I love Calm because it helps with sleep. It helps with um, breathing, guided breathing. Um, it's the number one app that I recommend for everyone. And if you want to help them learn how to regulate their, their breathing and their heart rate, they can use biofeedback apps that are focused that are there. And then this is the last part, which is think about how we can focus on our needs. Um, how do we work best? And are we being flexible? Are we thinking about trying to work from home all day long and then, 
you know, simultaneously have an unattended child in the next room and think they're really going to get their work done? <laughs> not really. Um, so maybe it's when you're not in your peak business hours that you start to, um, you know, pop out and then have them do their solid three hours of school. And then we want to, during the time maybe we're working or not attentive and able to be available, they use, they do low supervision kind of tasks. Um, there's plenty of things padded throughout their school day that they could be doing with less supervision needs than, um, than what we need. And everything that I mentioned was all here, except um, this last part, which is just know when to get help from teachers and professionals. We are forgetting that we are part of a PPT team, most of us. Um, we're forgetting that we have teachers to reach out to. Um, there's six weeks left of school, and this is the time that we have to jump at this opportunity. We've got to get going. We've got to kind of pull things together. We've gotten through our adjustment period. We need to now take the reins and say, how are we going to get through these last six weeks? If we can help support them in these ways, they are going to be so much better off for going back into school next year and for their life where we've had this unique opportunity to have them with us and let them learn from us. All of our adulting skills, how we keep ourselves organized all day, all of that is a wealth of information that we never ordinarily would have had. So we wanna think about that being um, actually a good thing. You know, Nobody's happy that we have COVID, but we're happy that we have our time with our kids in a way, right? So that we can do those things. So these are all just resources for you to um, consider looking at in the future. This is how you could reach out to me if you'd like. And that's it. Thank you so much. I just realized the time, so I wanted to finish up. How are you guys? Uh, there are a couple questions in the chat, Mary. Do you, do you see them? Oh, yes, I do see yeah. that. Um, my eighth grader daughter refuses to use any type of schedule to keep track of the work. Her case manager has sent out so many great example, sample ones to see if she would find one she likes. I end up checking her Google Classroom to remind her what's still due, what's still due. Another issue is she doesn't like checking emails. Oh, yes, I should mention that. Um, any suggestions? Okay. Incredibly um, uh, useful things to bring up. So not following a schedule. Um, oh, wait, we need the question go away. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so I think try, try again when it comes to the schedule. Um, I think letting kids be part of the process where they get to kind of co-create something with you. I mean, my daughter's only seven and I let her co-create her schedule. It doesn't matter how young they are. You can actually, if, if, when they have buy-in because they've participated in the process, that's uh, much more meaningful to them. And so that's the best strategy that most kids will respond to is that they got to be part of it. So, you know, it's all the same to us. If, if, at the end of the day, if they had, you know, art and then they did their science, like who cares which order they do it in. So, but they getting to choose it is, is all the difference. Um, so you going into Google Classroom is definitely um, not the goal. At, you know, for an eighth grader, um, I would say, you know, again, co-create, like sitting side by side together. So spoon feeding, like handing, delivering the information is not helpful. But if you say, I'm going to sit with you right now and I'm going to go into Google Classroom and I'm going to write down these things that are still outstanding, she's watching the process and she's at least side by side kind of participating and then you can start to maybe more engage her the next time but going off and doing it separately is just spoon feeding like kind of handing it over and not allowing the participation in it so the frustration i totally get but trying to you know just do it yourself or giving up on that it, you know wouldn't wouldn't work right so i think try to do it side by side um, I just checked out Smart But Scattered Teens. There does not appear to be a print version available on Amazon. You know, we're in this COVID weird, it's like Amazon Prime doesn't exist anymore. It's like all these things. Um, so I have the audio version. Um, I don't think it's bad because there's supplemental materials that are in a PDF that they tell you to go to a website for. So that does make up for the fact that some of the printed materials you don't have in front of you. So yeah, go for the audible version and just go with that. Um, 
Um, and I forgot to answer that first person's question about emails. All teenagers, all kids hate email it is like old lady stuff. They think that that's just for parents. <laughs> I don't need to email anybody. So that is another thing side by side to do with them and let them literally watch the whole process. I've had kids not want to admit that they even knew how to get into the email. And when they finally got in, they were like, okay, and now they're buried in a chain. And so who wrote that? And, you know, there's micro skills in there that kids aren't often able to say, like, I don't know how to do that. So, um, so try to just slowly get them embraced in it. Okay. Thoughts for helping to manage longer term projects over more than one week. How to chunk the work. My kids just want to be done and not go back to it and again to rework it. <clears throat> so the Elise app is something that helps with staggering or breaking down long term projects where it appears to the person, the, the kid, that it's just separate assignments and doesn't seem like, oh my God, this long thing, it's still not done and it's not really done till the end of the year. It just kind of breaking, it, you know, it helps you to kind of with them side by side, decide, okay, what part of it would be the rough draft? What part of it would be due and, and make up due dates. I make arbitrary due dates with kids all the time where the main assignment's done in June, but there's, you know, a lot of micro skills built in there. They need to do a rough draft. They need to do an outline. They, I'm going to make up a due date for it and, and put it in the app that says, this is the reminder that this outline is due on this date. Then the rough draft is due and then the final reference page or whatever, and then the actual final project. So using apps and technology as a way to embrace and kind of have a common uh, language or a bridge to talking to teens because they, um, they listen to apps and electro electronics more than us. Um, so I think that could help make it appear that the long-term assignment is really just four separate assignments. Yes, we will get a copy of the presentation. Um, comment or suggestion. I set the timer for my middle schooler to help him focus and not miss any classes. Uh, first period set timer for 30 or 45 minutes, then the timer goes off to the second period, etc. That's a really good idea. That's a great suggestion um, for kids to have timers. Um, that helps with the clocks and the passage of time and reminding them about time management strategies. Um, they don't have the bell that goes off and tells them it's time to, um, to go to the next class. So um, they can, especially our kids that are a little bit more anxious or obsessive, they can kind of keep going and going and going and not know when to stop also. And so knowing when is done is done, good enough and done. They're like teaching kids good enough. Is, um, is, is good to use timers for. So it's like, okay, you've worked on studying for 30 minutes and then boom, next timer goes off. So thank you, I like that recommendation. Uh, same here with my sixth grader. He doesn't follow a schedule and is not the best with sending emails. He hasn't really learned this skill yet, totally. How do I motivate him to be organized and find the best way that works for him? He also learns better when teachers provide a live class. Ugh, that doesn't happen often. Um, it helps to keep them engaged and connected, but not all teachers are doing that. He can have a hard time working independently. Okay, so um, there's separate things. So following the schedule, um, so not good with sending emails. These are skills that I just wanna point out. I teach at WestCon and I have students that are in their last year of college that are going off into internship and they have to connect by leaving a phone message and sending an email to their site supervisor. And they all have this, the, they've called me as many as 25 times before I have said, you're released from practice to go out into the world and send that voicemail now. <laughs> so there are college students that don't have these skills yet. They're so uncomfortable with phone and email. So don't be discouraged. You are actually really ahead of the game when you're working with a sixth grader on those skills of sending an email. So Keep sticking with it, doing side by side, co-creating, choosing the words together, revising it, and making them see that it's not an easy process, but we get through it, and it's something that'll be a little bit easier the next time. I do share, share screens with my, um, my, my, my patients right now, and it's really, I'm so proud 
to see now that when there's a high schooler writing an email to their teacher and I'm just like, you know, getting ready to formulate what could be an opening sentence and they just start typing on the screen and I'm like, oh my God, that was really good. That was exactly what I would have recommended. So they do get it. It's, it's just something you have to work on. Live classes are something that we are just kind of at the mercy of what we get is what we get. What do what, what you tell the kids? We get what we get and we don't get upset. Um, that's kind of our system right now with school. We are, you know, getting some supplementary, you know, nice live videos um, or Zoom classes, um, but it's, it's just not something we can expect is going to always be there. Um, you can write to your teachers and tell them. Um, you can have your, your child interact with them by sending them little video messages, things like that, um, to keep them engaged. I think using technology in that interesting way um, could be good. Like uh, my daughter uses Seesaw and there's a way to send a, a, a voice recording back to the teacher to say like, you know, thank you. I liked that read aloud you did today, you know, whatever it, it, it fosters connection. And so if you can get your um, kid to engage and connect in other ways, it doesn't have to be that there's a live interaction. Um, but I would always ask the teacher if they're willing to do um, a call, maybe once every other week or so. And again, we only have six weeks left. We could probably do one. Mary, there's a question right above that. <clears throat> what are some strategies um, that you would suggest an eighth grader coming from a private school, small group setting instruction in eighth grade and public school? general classroom setting. So moving from private school to a larger public school. Okay, I'm very concerned about the anxieties she may have as she comes into public school. What do you advise? Um, that's honestly, um, it, it can be overwhelming to go to a larger setting like that. I think that, um, wow, my normal gut reaction is go to the school, get yourself, get your feet wet, see the environment, get immersed in it. Um, so you're not seeing it for the first time on day one, uh, but we can't with COVID. So I think if there's any way for um, the, the, your child to have connection to the public school, maybe it's the guidance counselor that she does a Zoom session with, um, some kind of connection so that there's like that one person or even more than one person that she's met on the team at the school, that is... Um, so anxiety is, is really well treated with not reassurance. It's not, everything's gonna be okay, honey. Reassurance is actually bad, but actually giving the information. So saying, um, this is somebody you're gonna see. This is someone you're gonna check in with when you first get there. This is your new teacher. This is your new guidance counselor. Um, having them you know, make that face-to-face -face connection over the live um, FaceTime or something would be great if that was, that's my biggest recommendation. And then to get into that school campus, even, even drive by the school, try to get a sense of it, uh, join their Facebook page, follow their PTA page, kind of get to know what it's like at that school. Um, reach out to the PTA or the special needs PTA, whichever it is, so that you start to get connected to the parents. And then you can kind of talk to them about stuff. Okay, uh, when it comes to emotional state, uh, when it comes to emotional state, We've been doing a plan C with our um, eight-year-old with hopes to get a plan B conversation and collaborative problem solving. He gets aggressive when we take away the switch or any time when we try to do consequences for not doing homework. I suspect anxiety. Once I mention school, he tunes out. What's the best approach to try to get him through and not set him off? He won't do Zoom with a the therapist. Oh. Um, I was thinking of doing it on my own with specific situations. Okay, so um, so I, so you're using um, Dr. Green's uh, model, the collaborative problem solving method. I can see that. Um, I think that that's really hard to do in a vacuum without support. I actually follow their Facebook page so that I can um, work with uh, like hearing other parents and their experience with using plan B um, plans uh, with their kids so that they can you can get support from other parents who are going through similar things. Um, the one thing that I would point out is um, when you use the word consequences, it's making me think that it's not positive reinforcement being used. Um, I would make uh, rewards the focus rather than uh, taking away of something as, as a consequence. 
Um, so making a system where, um, for example, I have a lot of therapy clients that they are earning rewards um, is perfect for an eight-year-old. So, um, you know, reward points um, and having them decide, you know, for example, if it's really hard to sit at the dinner table for a full meal and you want to reward that behavior, it might be worth five points rather than just one point because it's really hard for them to do. Um, but working with a therapist, you could do that if your child won't do it. And having um, a, a Zoom session and getting parent coaching to help design a kind of behavior plan with rewards as the incentives is, um, I'm not just talking about stickers and, uh, you know, simple things like that, but you really do need um, somebody that can work side by side with you. And it doesn't have to be that your child participates. That would be my best suggestion. Um, so my child had a total meltdown this week. He was doing his work uh, longer than the recommended time due to fear or anxiety of work not getting completed and being okay with taking longer to do assignments. <clears throat> he has accommodations and is allowed extra time. We have talked with the teachers, are using exercise and timers, and have him email his teachers that assignments are taking longer, which seem to help him. However, he has a very hard time being flexible and a lot of anxiety. Um, shoot, I'm wondering what the age is for the child. Um, so there's, um, I can't tell how many this is child, but um, if you can write back and tell me the age, that would help me. He's 14. Oh, good, 14. Okay. So, okay. So timers, emails. Um, not all of these things I, I can say are, are always going to be completely like answerable in, in such a short way with limited information. I just want to just give you that disclaimer. But um, I think that when accommodations aren't working, it's time to get on the phone with the school and say, you know, what other things can I be doing um, to give them extra support? The recommendation of having parent coaching is always a standard answer. So that so these are not. <clears throat> one time, one off situations where your child had one bad day. If a child is regularly having these kinds of um, symptoms, I think that having regular contact with the school or regular contact with parent coach to be able to manage them so that they become less frequent um, would be what's needed. And so it's hard to know what the lack of flexibility is, and, um, but it sounds like anxiety is driving all of that. We just talked about how we're having a talk um, at the end of this month about increases in, in anxiety in kids and this recommendations that we're giving out for um, kids right now. I think that's um, a talk that also might be helpful to you. If I didn't very specifically enough um, address your question, I think it would be good if you tried to email me. Um, so do you think having a Zoom meeting with a counselor and perhaps some teachers would be beneficial to ease anxiety? Yes, uh, and thank you. Um, I think the Zoom counselor, um, a, a, a counselor meeting is very helpful. The services that um, were available on someone's 504 or IEP um, haven't necessarily transferred into real life now where we're just doing that same thing at home. So like you might have four hours of uh, um, uh, special education services, but they're, they're getting maybe one hour per week only with um, the new system. Um, if that, you know, some aren't getting that at all. But I think that it's an easy fix to ask to talk to the case manager or the um, guidance counselor and be able to say um, that there are some things that are just not working at home. And then if that's, you know, not enough, um, because, you know, they're in unchartered territory too, that they might not have recommendations right at the go to just like launch and say, here, try this. Um, because nobody's been in this situation before. Um, I think your best chance might actually be to work with a therapist who has been working with kids who are going through these issues while they're at home. So at least there's some experience base um, while you've been talking to them. Mary, there's two questions in the chat. Um, and uh, one is a um, uh, 16 year old son won't get out of bed for classes and classwork starting to slip. Okay. 
So whenever I hear that, that does concern me because it makes it sound like that person could have depression. And um, I really should have like this huge disclaimer across me that says like, I can't diagnose it. I should not be making these kinds of comments. But I just I, like ethically feel like I have to say that um, because I have that concern. So, um, so I think that if there's somebody that um, the child feels connected to, um, I know this must be hard, but I know I have um, met with clients brand new on the internet, meeting them for the first time and not just old clients that have transferred onto the computer. It, it can be so hard to start with a new therapist, but I honestly think that somebody who is not getting out of bed needs an evaluation. And so that might be the pediatrician, that might be um, you know, something like the guidance counselor. You would have to kind of gauge that um, seriousness level in that um, for your child to know, is this something like um, that has happened before? and you knew how to pull the child out of the, the um, <clears throat> situation, or um, is it brand new? Um, it's kind of, I think an evaluation really needs to happen. That's the safest thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, here's another one. It's a little long, uh, longer. Uh, Son is in the 18 to 21 transitional program for disabled students. Uh, the, the OCD, ADHD, high functioning ASA, which I think it might be ASD and GAD. He struggles with writing papers. Uh, they're really impossible to do and requires help with each sentence. He often becomes overwhelmed and becomes emotionally dysregulated. He's very intelligent and a good student and wants to go to college. What accommodations should we be requesting for him to be successful? I'm afraid he will not be able to keep up in the required freshman English composition class. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing that he's probably closer to the end of the transition program, thinking about trying to get into a college program. So, um, so I would say that, um, you know, first is making sure that you're still working with members of the um, PPT team. Um, because when there's very specific, um, like, you know, help needed with direct instruction uh, for writing, for example, uh, that might be something that we just don't intuitively know how to do or support from home. Um, I would say that writing uh, is a special challenge of several of my clients. So one of the things that we've been doing is trying to take the graphomotor part out of it and um, not have to have their thoughts translate to their hand because they can usually think a lot faster than they can write. Um, so the writing process is really labored for them. So I have asked people to use the accessibility options in Microsoft Word, for example, and be able to just speak and have um, text to speak or speech to text. Um, to generate getting all of their, um, their thoughts and ideas onto the paper. Um, that's something that can help, then you clean it up and then you have a writing um, product at the end. I think uh, working with somebody from the school on that is, is really helpful. Um, but that's probably one of the recommendations that they would give. And um, and then often, you know, just becoming dysregulated is something that you can kind of do some prep work um, where you're doing your breathing exercises with them using the Calm app, something that helps to like bring their focus and um, bring them a sense of calm before they start to do a task that's challenging, just to make sure their baseline is like really calm going into it. And then they'll have more leeway to be able to handle the frustration better. Um, and then I would say, like, you know, depending on how much time you have, like if there's ever a situation where you have time before college is going to start, trying to take um, an online class to be able to see what the workload is like, what it's like to, um, I, I do this thing called college boot camp with kids when they're rising seniors and they're about to go into college. And even a bunch, unfortunately, you know, they fail out of college the first semester and bounce back out. Um, I do this shoring up of executive functioning with them where I have them go through, this is what 
like, because it's my old syllabus from, from one of the classes that I offer, I actually show them, this is what a college syllabus is like. For six weeks over the summer, we're going to go through all of these tasks. This is what you would be expected to do as a college student. And then the first time they see it is not off when they're, you know, on their own at college and have less support. They're not like right there with you. So, um, so getting through all of those, like, you know, where do I look? What is Blackboard? How do I get in and out of these systems? And what, what does the teacher expect? And all of those things. Um, that's really nice to be able to do while you're home. And another unexpected benefit of being home right now, that somebody could take an online class and, and test the waters for what it's like. All right. I feel like I remember seeing a question about the sleeping app, but I can't find it in the chat. <laughs> it's actually in, um, it's in, it's up above. She wanted you to go over the Marconi, uh, what that is. Oh, so it is, um, it's not an app. That was a screenshot of YouTube. So Marconi Union is just the name of the, the, I don't know, singer, whatever. It's not, it's not a song, but it's just instrumental. Um, so basically, um, you go to YouTube and it's on a continuous loop of 10 hours where you listen to this music that's very sleep promoting. Um, so they actually know a lot about sleep science from studying astronauts where they have to simulate, um, like NASA's done a lot of the sleep research, to, to simulate um, day and night um, and to keep their circadian rhythms um, correct while they're there. So, so there's this thing called binaural beats. It's the way it hits your, um, your ears. And so it's hitting sound waves, something about the sound waves are hitting both your ears at the same time. And so it's the most sleep promoting um, constellation of compilation of music that, um, that research has ever studied. And so this particular one is the one that's been studied the most and they know really helps to promote sleep and to keep people asleep. So keeping it on like as a form of like white noise all night long is a way to keep people um, in that state of, um, you know, deeper sleep. So it's, it's just a helpful um, thing to run through a speaker, through your phone, through Alexa devices um, throughout the night so that you can help stay asleep and get to sleep. Um, just a couple comments, because I know we're, we're kind of getting close to the time range here. Um, first comment was for the question on accommodations, that's actually a presentation we could do in and of itself. Um, <laughs> There's such a wide range of accommodations you can ask for and depending on the college that you're going to some are more accommodations friendly than others and there's it's there's just a lot built into that question so if the person who asked it wants to reach out to us um you know on her own we can certainly try to help guide her to the right resources and then another thing mary you probably already know this but a lot of the apps um that you posted are actually on my son's disability office up in college so these are things that if they start to learn how to use now, they yeah. can continue to use them when they're in college. And I, I was so tickled because I was just looking through it yesterday and I saw, oh wow, I know Mary had posted these, um, yeah. these different apps last week on her presentation. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up again because they're, they're great apps and there are things they can continue to use in their post-secondary education. Yes, thank you, yes, that's great. I'm glad right. schools are on top of that too. Yeah, we have two more questions and then I can't see. There was, oh, the slide about biofeedback. Um, oh, so there was a slide on apps about biofeedback. Does it work better when children use it on a daily basis or how could they use it in a week? Okay, so the frequency of biofeedback, um, it really does uh, matter how much somebody's uh, nervous system is regulated. So if you have a sensory kid, you have a kid who has um, a, a nervous system that is not like others where they have a neurological condition. Um, they, their baseline is much more anxious than others maybe also. They would benefit from doing it daily. Um, if there's someone who just kind of needs to lock in their focus and put their tension away uh, and not be nervous before a test, they could maybe do it just on demand on situations where they're more nervous. But so it matters about your kid and their baseline of how much um, they're doing it or might need it. I always tell people in the very beginning to get the practice down pat, to do it for the first week, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime, just to remember different times of the day to do it. 
And then it becomes more second nature, the breathing method that you're teaching them so that they can invoke that breathing method whenever they need it on demand in the future. <clears throat> and then how do I talk about to my eight-year-old son and tell him that sleep is important without him saying, stop, that's boring to me. Tell him about the astronauts. <laughs> tell him about how, um, so it's, it's actually just such a part of, um, an important part of medicine, if maybe science appeals to him, if, um, if, you know, the astronaut thing might also appeal to him. Uh, there's sleep promoting light bulbs that we have and music that we have and lots of things that we know all because of NASA. And that might appeal to an eight-year-old boy. I think that could be kind of fun. Mm. <clears throat> That's that awkward Zoom silence. Yes. Every time I say we don't have any more questions, it always pops up another question. <laughs> but yeah. I think we are almost running out of time. It's, oh, it's almost, yeah. Maybe we have 10 more minutes before the webinar times out, but. Looks like people are starting to leave too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Mary, thank you so much. You were wonderful. You provided such great information. Um, you know, this is definitely a topic where, um, especially with our older kids, they, we really want them to start doing it independently and kind of trying to release the reins and because that independence with organization is something that they, that they really need their whole life. So now is the perfect time to start encouraging them. Um, now that they're home in our, you know, in our sites at all times, start encouraging them to do things on their own, like writing emails and reaching out to teachers when they're having difficulty and writing out a schedule prioritizing their assignments and that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, it's just been great. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate being able to be here at this or virtually be here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you in a virtual session another day. Okay. Oh, we're doing um, something about anxiety at the end of the month. Um, so that'll be something we post soon, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, right, so I will see you all then. Yes, yeah. we will. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.